Friday night racing. On off the ball. And they're off. Brought to you by Go Racing. Plan your day at the races at goracing.ie. And you're very welcome along. It is Friday Night Race with myself, Johnny Ward, standing in for Ger Gilroy today uh, with Noel Mead. Um, we've already gotten the chat going um, actually off camera, so hopefully we'll continue it on camera. And uh, I have to mention David Jennings tipped up an 8 to 1, 9 to 1 winner last week. I wasn't here, Noel, fortunately. Well, um, he's very good at tipping horses. We'll have to wait and see what we can do. He's also the biggest fan I know of yourself. And he, if he, if he'd been told in time, I think he would have made it in today. Um, is I don't think it's a, it's entirely a Mead connection as well. I just, although he does like Jar Lines as well, but I just think he really likes you. Oh, well, that's nice to know. Yeah. Uh, now nah, he's a, listen. Uh, I must say, I think David's a very good journalist, and he he writes he writes very well. And uh, we've from the time he started, we've always got on very well. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the the Royals connection is strong as well, and it's a good time to be a Royals fan. Hopefully, yeah. Um, yeah, look, we're back into Division One and and uh, like in the the final of the Division Two final tomorrow. So hopefully that'll go well, and um, we're on the up. I hope. How strong is your football interest? Ah, uh, look, I I don't think uh, the last uh, championship match I missed was um, back in. in the year that we had the four uh, matches in a row. 91 was it? Yeah, I missed a match because I couldn't go because I had a runner in the derby. And other good than that, excuse. I, as a good excuse. And I think I missed one, I was away on holidays one year for a replay of a match as well. And other than that, I'd never miss a championship match. But it's very difficult now to get to all the league matches because we're, we're, we're racing every Sunday or even Saturdays and it's, it's, hard to get, it's hard to get to them. So I haven't actually, I've seen a couple of the, uh, one of the league matches and a couple of the Bourne Cup ones. But if I can at all, I always go. Are you down on football at the moment in terms of where it's gone the last 10 years I know William McCreary has been very critical of it or have you kind of stayed loyal to it Ah yeah well I think look it was hard to watch a lot of the f football the way it's been played over the last couple of years like I mean it was it's hard for anybody to watch it not just the dominance of the dubs because the dubs are good and they're 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 Good to watch, and like the, the you know they play with a with a great flair, and you'd enjoy watching. They're they're such good players, but that defensive game that came in over the number of years there was very difficult to watch. Like it was, it was terrible stuff. Did you it's, play yourself? There's a funny story about that. I've told it a few times. A few people have told it, but the first time my mother came to see me playing football, we were playing in a in a. I actually think I've heard the story. <laughs> 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 but then maybe I shouldn't tell it, but it, well, it's it sort of ends. It tells you that it it, it it answers the question as to how well I played. Um, she came anyway to see me play on on a, a sports day in the neighbouring uh, parish, and that evening when we were having our tea, she comes and she said to me, "No, remember when I said to you to keep away from the ball so you wouldn't get hurt?" She says, "I didn't really mean it." <laughs> so that was the end of my football career. Uh, we're always in association with GoRacing.ie here on Friday Night Racing. Um, I was doing a little bit of research on you, and um, I, I knew that Tuva was the horse that was very, you know, original to the story. And you're you're based in Tuva now, but was it 1970 when you trained your first winner? That just didn't add up in my head at all. 1971, I think. Even that doesn't add up. Yeah, no. 1971. Uh, yeah, uh, I I actually had a license in a permit in '69. And what age uh, are you? I am sixty-eight. Yeah, so that so I was very young at the time. Teenager. Yes, and um, as a pal of mine, a, a neighbour of mine, a farmer, a uh, dairy farmer, that was beside me, and um, we bought a, a horse. The first horse we had that won was Tuva, but we actually had a one or two before that uh, that was weren't very good. Uh, not saying the Tuva was that. Good, but he at least you he rode won, it. He won, I rode him to win a race in Wexford, uh, maiden hurdle in Wexford, an amateur maiden hurdle in Wexford, in which he beat a horse that was ridden by none other than Dermot Weld. I was almost very proud of that fact. I doubt but, Dermot mentioned it. No, he uh, didn't. <laughs> didn't. Uh, and the other time, actually, funny, I was in uh, Mouse Morris's house one day, and he had a photograph up on the wall of he beating me in Galway in an amateur handicap hurdle. He was riding a horse of, of Peter McCreary's and he beat me a neck. Um, I was on Tuva 
and uh, he had it up on the wall and it was you know one of the very ordinary race and I for considering the great winners that Mouse rode and the great winners he trained and whatever I couldn't believe this was up on the wall but he he was joked with me he says the reason it was up there was because he had me behind him and that was where he wanted to keep me you know <laughs> so I wasn't much of a jockey either now to be honest Do you remember much about the Wexford race? Yeah I think he probably ran away with me um, look uh, he was he kind of he kind of um Ah, I do remember it. It was a great day, you know, to ride a winner. But he kind of, uh, we, we fancied him a couple of times and he was second. He was a great horse to finish second. But he, he the, the time before was the time that Mouse had beaten him in Galway. And we, when we came back from Galway, we decided we'd give him a break. And I gave him a couple of weeks off. And I only had him in about two weeks. And I didn't think that he would be, it sort of opened my eyes about training horses. When he came back in, he was fresh and ready. And he was, he, he bombed home in, in Wexford that day. What was your kind of eye for a horse or in terms of training at that stage when to know you, you obviously had a handful of horses at most, how is this horse, is he ready? Um, and it must have been learning on the job as a very young trainer. Absolutely, it was like, I mean, you know, it was, it, I used to have uh, a couple of racing ponies and uh, actually Raymond Carroll, if anybody remembers me, he's Gary's father, used to ride the ponies, and another guy who actually ended up riding a Gold Cup winner and riding and riding a um, national winner, John Burke, he went to Fred Rymel, he used to ride the ponies at the time. And uh, we, I sort of started off at that and then moved on when we got on to the, to the racehorses then. But it started off with one, and it was really trial and error all the way, because I never, I rode out uh, for a, you know, a, I suppose, 12 months in uh, Bryce Smith's, Helen Bryce Smith's uh, mother more than her father because she was more the trainer than her That's father. That's Declan's really. mother, is it Declan McDonald's? Declan, Declan's mo mother, yes. Who's the um, leading most, I think, point to point lady amateur rider. Yeah, she was a brilliant rider. Like, I mean, uh, Helen was a very, very good rider. Mm. And, you know, Helen has only stopped riding in the last year or two. I was talking to, to uh, Desi about it the other day. He, he, and the reason she stopped was I think that she just she, she's Helen is a good age. I don't I won't say what age she is now, but she's a fair age at the moment. And I think that the reason she stopped was that she just couldn't see maybe as well as she could or something like that. It was it was quite amazing actually why she why she rode for so long. What was your racing background? None, absolutely none. In fact, we were farmers, and uh, my father was very anti-horse and and. Uh, really felt anybody that had anything to do with horses went broke because the only connection he had with it was a brother of his, Jack, uh, who was, Jack was good at the drinking and good at the uh, racing and all that and he went through every penny he ever had and uh, that my father had no time for horses because of that, you know. Yeah, had you an alternative idea of what you might do or? Ah, look, I was, I was brought up to be a farmer mm. and, and, and I came home from school very young I was, I was, uh, my father got ill and I was home when I was 16 and uh, running the place and uh, he, like from, from very early on I was, I was, I was running the place so I started, when I started with the horses then he, he, he got better uh, after a couple of years and he came back into the, into the business again but not, not very strong so I still more or less was farming but once the training got going, whereas he never stopped me, uh, it it sort of ballooned quick enough, you know. What was the landscape like back then as a young horse racing trainer? I don't think there was anything like the amount of uh, people from the outside coming into it at that stage. You know, anybody that was connected in racing was was more or less in racing, and and there were very few people that sort of came along that weren't in racing. I, I, I haven't said that now, Jim Bulger started around the same time as me. He had a farming and, uh, background as well. Yeah, Jim Jim was into show jumping more at that stage and, 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 and uh, well, I think he started near enough around the same time. Mm. And how did you finance it? Well, at that time, uh, we hadn't a tosser now, to be honest with you, not a tosser. Like, Tuva cost 100 quid. So we had fifty a piece. That was that was the price from mm -hmm. in Goffs. He was he was a, 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 a sold by Buster Harty, uh, John Harty's uh, brother and 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 uh, his uncle and, is it? Yeah, Eddie's uncle yeah. and 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 Eddie and old Eddie's brother and and uh, he was he was pin fired and he'd won on the flat for them 
and uh, we bought him for like with pin fired legs, which I suppose we didn't know that much about at the time. And it just um, we, he was lucky. He was he, he stayed right. I suppose he probably stayed right because uh, he was in a small yard, and we were able to look after him really well. And he spent a lot of the time in the, under the hose and this, that, and the other. But he he he, he never actually gave us any leg trouble. Um, but. Uh, but was the farming sort of sustaining it at that stage in terms of getting money? Oh yeah, well at the time, at the time uh, when horses went to the races, the uh, uh, racing board at the time had done a deal with uh, CI. It was free transport, so if you entered the horse and you had him in, the racing board actually paid for him to go to the races. So CIE had a contract to bring the horses. So in actual fact, once you had him entered, then you were brought to the race. So we went racing care of CIE. Save some amount of money now. Uh, right? Absolutely. And, and like you loaded up in the horse box and away you went. And that was the way we went. And, and, and for years, uh, with uh, um, Larry Oakes's father was a fellow called Frank... Uh, uh, Larry o or Frank Oakes's father was a guy called Larry Oakes. He used to drive a, a CIE box and, and uh, Larry used to pick us up and bring us off the races and it was gas. We'd stop on the way home and to, everybody had to drink, even the, even Larry and everybody had to drink on the way back and, and, and uh, we'd arrive back and, and uh, we went all over. We toured Ireland in the CIE Times. box. Yeah. Fra Frank Oakes was in the news recently because he's still riding out at 77 and I think he's a couple of horses uh, still, uh, one of whom won Mountain Carl. But who were your early riders in those days? Uh, well, at the time, like the, the kingpin was Tommy Carberry, Bobby Coonan. They were the king, king of the jump, the jump men at the time. And uh, on the flat you had Johnny Rowe and um, Wally Swinburne. Like, well, Wally mightn't have just, have, might have been a year or two after that. He came over to Ireland to ride for Dermot Wild. And it would say in your early days you, you focused primarily on the flat. Well, it wasn't so much that I, I focused so much on the flat. I focused on anything I, that anyone would give me. Mm. And, uh, like, when I started off with one, and then uh, he won a couple of races, and then a couple of people asked me would I train horses. So I think the first year I had four, and the four of them won. And then it just built up from there. And very early on, I got a very good filly called Sweet Mint, uh, who ended up winning at Royal Ascot. And uh, she won the Corkinari, which is now the, the the big six furlong race on the on the Saturday. Yeah. And and uh, it because of that, I got more flat horses. And it was it probably was a better way of, of financing the thing for me because if you bought um. The, the way it worked was I'd buy probably 20 yearlings every year, maybe 25, and uh, at the lower end of the market, I never really bought uh, sprinters or sharp two-year-olds. I always bought horses that would stay, you know, that I would buy milers or mile and a quarter horses or even mile and a half horses, and that they were a little bit bigger because if they weren't good enough to, be, uh, to go in the flat, they could go and, and run over jumps. Mm. So if you bought a jumper and he was slow, he was a hunter. If you bought a, a flat horse and he was slow, you still had a chance he'd be a jumper. So, And they were always very saleable. So it, 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 worked, it worked very well, and that was the format, really. Did you make a, a gradual shift in towards national hunt racing sort of in the 80s and 90s? Um, or were you, did you still see yourself very much as a dual-purpose trainer? No, in the 90s, in the 90s, I, was, I remember one day, I was doing the entries for the Curra, and, like, at that time... Uh, Ballydoyle was just starting to build up again. Aidan was after going into Ballydoyle, he was just starting to, to, to crank up again now, and not that it was ever went down because Incent was there up until that. And uh, the Arabs had come in big time into Ireland. The Aga Khan had a huge amount of horses in Ireland as well. And I was doing the entries, and I just thought to myself, Christ, all I have is horses that run in handicaps. And I thought to myself, if I, if I put I had a couple of clients at the time that could spend reasonable money. If I put that into jumping horses, maybe we might get up there. So we switched totally over towards the jumping at that stage, and everything we bought after that were uh, jumpers rather than flat horses. Is there much and of a difference in terms of training them? Because Joseph Ryan says it's basically the same pr principle. Well, it's the same principle other than the fact that it's twice as easy to train a flat horse mm. because the, the flat horse doesn't take as much work doesn't get as many injuries and he can run or he can't basically mm. you know um, I think that uh, flat trainers get away with more really because they, 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 uh, it, is, it is twice as difficult to train jumpers yeah. keeping them sound you have to train them to jump 
you have to you have to get them to stay. So they need a lot more graft, a lot more. They have to have a, a, a much more in the bottom than the other ones. You know, once the the flat, once a flat horse, you get them fit. Like it's just a case case of keeping them nice and fresh. What were your early flats or your early successes rather with your jump horses then? I had a very good uh, couple of horses, uh, which were more or less summer horses. Uh, a horse called Pinch Hitter. He won the Galway Hurdle uh, twice. Uh, John Joe O'Neill won on him, and he won the. Actually, he won two McDonough handicaps as well in Galway. He was a really Galway specialist, and he was he uh, he was beaten in the Mac- Thomas McDonough on another occasion only by a head and he was actually he probably ran the race for his life that year top weight and he just got nudged out off the bend and, and he was beaten ahead uh, giving away something nearly almost three stone I think that day so that was he won the hurdle that year alright but he won two or he won a four and a five year old and um, he won he was a very good horse and we had another horse at that time called Steel Duke who was a very good horse as well and again a very good horse in Galway uh, won all, won that the, all those big flat handicaps in Galway, the the amateur race, the race on the Friday. He won them a couple of times, and he was he was uh, a very good horse. Didn't it didn't transfer to jump, and even though he was born as a jumper, he was he jumped very well, but he jumped he jumped too slow. To, he wasn't he wasn't as he was too cagey jumping to make him a good horse. How special was Sausalito Bay for you then? Ah, oh, that was that was a day in a million. Like we had a f- lot of heartbreak at that stage. Like you know, in terms of Cheltenham or in general, and in, 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 ter- in terms of Cheltenham. Mm. But um, the the best horse we'd had up to that uh, had been a horse called Fane Ranger. He was we had him around the same time as we had Pinch Hitter, and uh, he was a very very good horse. And in hindsight, looking back at it now, I could never understand why when he was. He came into training. He'd be very good for us two to three months, and then he'd just go away on you. And at that time, we didn't know anything about ulcers or horses that bleed, or like we do now, because we like uh, everything has improved so much in the in the veterinary end of it. Now we know that horses do suffer a lot from ulcers, and I'd say that's what he suffered from because he used to go very starey and whatever, and lose his form. And I think that was what happened to him. And if we knew that. If we knew then what we know now, it would have been easier to 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 work him. But uh, he was he was an ex, uh, exceptional horse. And the next one that came along after him was a horse um, called Tiananmen Square. Um, he was a horse that was was uh, he won his first two races. He would he was. He, he won his first two bumpers and he then went to Cheltenham and he got beat by um, Pat Flynn's horse, what was it, Montelado. Montelado, yeah. And he came back to Punchestown and he beat Montelado in the in the uh, champion bumper in Punchestown. Um, he was, um, Tim Hyde, young Tim, rode him in, in Cheltenham and it was, at that time you couldn't claim in the bumper I don't think you can now either but you couldn't claim in the bumper so it, like I mean he lost his claim and he, he hadn't he couldn't take his claim and he he got you know it was a tough ask for a, for a young fella in a race like that and uh, Montelado beat him but when he came back to, to Punchestown he beat Montelado and he was a very good horse he won his next his next two over hurdles when he started the following season and then he did something behind and despite the fact he came back and he won again and he ran second in the champion hurdle trial in Haydock beaten by the champion hurdle winner he never was the same horse again he, he, there was something wrong with him behind all the time we never could figure out what was wrong so he faded away it's funny when Sausalito Bay is mentioned Nick uh, Best Mays is nearly always mentioned the same sentence Sausalito Bay came along he was he, he was sold out of Ian Baldings and uh, he was he was a, a beautiful horse, like a very good-looking, strong horse. But he was, he uh, Sausalito Bay was uh, five. F- was he four or five when we bought him? Was he five when he won it? Uh, he might have even be five when we bought him. And uh, he was bought at the horse and train sell. And uh, he he was a he he probably was a very good horse too. But unfortunately, the following season he went and fell at uh, schooling. 
Oh no, he fell in the in the he fell at the second last in the Hatton's Grace hurdle, in the, and uh, broke his pelvis, and he was the, he never was the same horse after that either. Considering the amount of, I think you were seven time champion jockey in Ireland. Was Shelton very frustrating? Was it just for whatever reason? It was just a struggle. And we, I, if I think um, Nick and our go native, Sausalito Bay, Road to Respect, um, and I'm probably missing. Yeah, one. you're missing the, the the land of one the three mile novels. Um, um, very wood. Very wood. Yeah, yeah, it was because the first run, the second runner we had in Shelton was a horse called uh, Batista, mm. and he could beat a short head in the Triumph. That was very early on. Now, that was probably 77 or 78. Now, it didn't have a runner in it again then for a long time. And um, then everything seemed to work against us after that. Um, the, there, was the, there was the Hill Society situation where he, he they took them the best part of a half an hour to work out whether he was won or, he, or whether he could beat or, or whatever in the photograph. Um, the... Nice thing about that particular, not that was nothing nice about it because it, it took so long and everybody thought he'd won. And the more they showed it, the more it looked like he won. Richard Dunwoody wrote him and he said to me when he came in, he said, No, I think he's beat. He said, I think he was in front before and in front after, but I think on the line he's beat. And Tony McCoy rode the, rode the winner, Champlieve, and he thought he was beat. And Martin Pipe thought he was beat. He came over to me and said that, but when, that was heartbreaking that time, that day. And then we had um, a couple of other ones that, like, as I say, Batista was beaten a short head in the trial, or a head in the triumph. He was beaten a short head in that. At this stage, we hadn't had a winner. And it seemed to be every year something where we had another horse going very well in the triumph the following year, I think. And he got, he got, uh, he was between the last two hurdles, just going to the last hurdle, going really well. For some reason or another, he put his foot in the hole and he fell on the flat. So it was one thing after another seemed to be seemed to be going. Just we got a native Dara looked as if he had the Car, the Carl Cup one, and he got hot up boys caught him on the line. So it was it when the man did come along and win. It was um, a great. It was more relief than anything else. It's like Willie in the Gold Cup this year, I think. Yeah, get yeah. that out the way. Yeah, well, of course, yeah. But the the, the we just didn't seem to have any luck over there at all at the time. Who was the best horse you trained? I always thought Cardinal Hill was. Um, he, he, he got. He came. Paul came off him at the second last in the Supreme Novice. That's another one of the ones that. Now the horse that won it was uh, Hard of the War, who went on and won the champion the following year, and like people would say, he wouldn't have beaten him. I don't know what we what we saw him do working. He was just hard to believe it. We had a very good horse at the time called Sunshine Street, who was for, fourth in the Epsom Derby. And believe me, I know the other horses are a year older than them, but if Sunshine Street, Sunshine Street was beaten three lengths in the Epsom Derby, Cardinal Hill would have won the Epsom Derby. He was mm. a leg tied up. He was, that, he was that good a horse. Yet Harchibald, um, who was one, definitely one of my favourite horses and one of many people's favourite horses, he didn't win at Cheltenham. But every time you know you think of him now, it just brings a smile to your face when you think of Harchibald and those days and the glory days of him and Brave Inca and obviously Hardy uses the, the the different characters involved and just the epic races. Yeah, you know that that race and Paul actually says it at the time. You know when we, when when we look back at that particular race. And he travelled so well. I was watching it with Desi, and he sort of half said, "Well done, halfway up the run in." And uh, then the next thing he'll come back up. You know, when you think of the two horses that he was up against that day, he couldn't have he couldn't have uh, made, too made, bumped into two two hardier horses like Hardy Eustace and 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 Brave Inca were two hard nuts, and he was stuck in the middle of them. Um, look at Archie; was a great horse. He had. He when was misunderstood in a way, wasn't he? Well, he probably was. I, maybe I misunderstood him a bit too. I, I used to stand up for him all the time and got annoyed with people when they called him this, that and the other. But what people didn't know about Archie was that he was that he had, when he came from France originally, he he didn't get home. And I sent him down to Ned going on the car and I said, Ned, I want you to hob them. And he said, there's nothing wrong with him. And I said, well, if, if you don't, if you can't, uh, he's no good the way he is. So he sent him back up and he didn't do anything to him. So again, I sent him back down to him again and we did him, we hobbled him anyway. And that changed him. He just with that. But he always struggled a little bit with his wind. And when he came under pressure, he came, he struggled. 
and, and his head used to, to come up. But like when their head comes up like that, generally it means that they're, 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 they're trying to get the air because they breathe through their nostrils and they're trying to get their head up straight out in front of them to let the air flow in. Now, having said that, after a while, I presume when they realise this is going to happen, it makes them it's a, a mental, thing. mental thing with them, you know. And uh, he certainly, he, he, when he was in front for any length of time, he wasn't crazy about it. But I, I'll never forget, he won... He won two uh, um, fighting fifths. Fight and, fifth, and he won two Christmas hurdles in Kempton. And he was beaten in a Christmas hurdle in Kempton in a photo finish. And Paul said to me, that, like when the ground was sticky, he was really struggled. And uh, Paul said to me after, I, I, believe it or not, I, I won the Kempton, I won the race in Kempton four times, the, the Christmas hurdle in Kempton four times. I've never been in Kempton. And I won the fight and fifth three times and I've never been in Newcastle. What's on but, the day in Newcastle? Uh, uh, Fairy House is yeah. on that day, the, the big meeting in Fairy House and I just didn't go. And uh, we're going eight of one as well with Davy Condon, so I didn't go. But uh, the time he got beaten and um, uh, Tony McCoy beat him on, on, on a horse of, of Giffords. Uh, straw Bear. Straw Bear. And he, Paul said to me after, he said, you know, I, I was... A little bit annoyed at Paul after the race because didn't, he didn't hit him. Or, Would you ever uh, be annoyed at Paul? Oh, I will. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? Could you, could you ever be annoyed at Paul? Jesus, he <laughs> put you to the pinny of collar sometimes. But anyway. But, um, anyway, he said to me, and I'll never forget it, the following day we were in Leopardstown, and I said to him, Jesus, why didn't you hit him? And he said, uh, and there was a tear in his eye when he said it to me. He said, sure, he said he was doing his best. He was doing his best, and and uh, he like he actually said he was struggled the whole of that race. He just he was he couldn't get out of the ground, and he said to Ruby halfway down the back, whatever I don't know what Ruby was riding. He said to halfway down the back, he said I've no chance here. He said that, but he ended up getting just getting touched off. But uh, I never forget him saying to me, he says he was doing his best. <laughs> Talk about Paul Carberry and just uh, the talent that he had. Yeah, look, he was, a, he was a, there's no question or doubt about it, he was a genius. Uh, he, he, he could get horses to do things that, that a lot of people couldn't. And a lot of people used to, used to say, oh, he sits too quiet and this, that and the other. But Paul would be squeezing and squeezing a long time before he'd ever go from them. And like, I mean, um, oftentimes I'd be watching him riding on a horse and people standing beside me think, oh, he's going real well. And I'd know well he wasn't going well at all, that he was just actually out. And when he was, when Paul went for one, he usually was nearly, that was the end of it, you know. When, when he went for, for broke, he was usually gone. But, um, yeah, I just think if, if, uh, if things were back again and he had another run at it, he'd do a better job. Oh. Uh, uh, oh, was that just part of his genius? Uh, maybe it was, but I just think that he, he could have concentrated more on his life in the, in the saddle. And, and if he did, he would have, he, like he was a brilliant rider. And he had, he'd, he'd, it's a very short spell that they're riding for. Uh, if he had the dedication that Nina had, I think he would have been a better rider. He, like, he was a brilliant rider, but he, he could have been a better rider. How would you sum up Nina's career? Actually, Nina was, like, uh, Nina is just special. Like, she concentrated on what she did, and she gave your best all the time, whether she was working in the yard or looking after the, looking after horses or, you know, riding horses. She was just a special, she's a very special lady. Mm, mm. You've you've had some great jockeys in your time, and Sean Flanagan has come in, and um, I think from left field. I remember Sean used to ride a horse I was involved in. I remember he went to America, and it looked like his career was kind of all up in the air, and he came back, and we've had him on. I remember he he went up to your place, and we didn't really know how it was going to happen, but it's it's turned out unbelievably well. Yeah, he was. Uh, I suppose to be honest, he was lucky uh, the way it happened. Uh, to be there at the time. But what had happened was, Sean came in to me in the middle of his problems when things weren't going right for him. And let's face it, you can't win races unless you're on the horses. Like, uh, ask Ruby, uh, what's the secret to success? And Ruby will tell you, getting on the horses. Like, it doesn't matter. If you're riding Cato Star and you're, uh, or whatever horse it be, like Cato Star, you have a better chance of winning than the fellow that's riding the other one. One thing leads to another, so it gives you confidence. Abs absolutely. Riding, you know. But Sean had come to ride out for us, and he was, he was, um, 
uh, at that time Paul was there and, and there was a few more I think David Conn was probably there as well and a few more and there was plenty of people around and he sort of he, he was a bit lost and he had no place to go and he asked could he come and ride out and he came and rode out once or twice and he, or uh, once or twice a week and he I had noticed him and I watched him after that and I watched him and I, I sort of thought this fella can ride alright but I had no place for him at the time and then he uh, it just happened that when he came back the next time that I had remembered him and I had been thinking about him and I said it to Paul when he retired I said what do you think of this fella and he said uh, when he said I've never ever seen him do much wrong he mm -hmm. said and he's tough and he's, uh, and he's slotted in really well and it seems to be getting better and better with us all the time because he works at home with us and he's there every day and he's, he's, he's worth listening to when he says something like, you know, if he says he thinks this should go this way or that way or, you know, maybe he's, getting, he's not getting enough work or he's getting too much work. He's, he's, he's worth listening to and he he's, he's, has a good opinion on what he's saying and he doesn't say too much either, you know, he's, he's, it's easy to talk to him. Uh, just reflecting on Cheltenham this year, Road to Respect could have gone both routes. He ended up running in the Ryanair, and I was watching the race, and I thought, it was the third of the fourth last up until then, I thought, this horse is going to win. Missed one, and then was a gallant third. Yeah, I was very disappointed now, to be honest with you. Um, but... It was my it, it was my idea and Sean's to run him in the Ryanair. There was no there wasn't it wasn't Michael already that pushed us that way. It was we we decided uh, from last year we felt that he didn't get home and that he didn't stay last year and that uh, his best chance of winning in Cheltenham was going to be the Ryanair. Um, and like you, I thought uh, he, at that stage he had a great chance, but he did actually walk through the, the third last. Now look, did it get him beat? Well, it certainly didn't help him. Mm. You can't, like, yeah, if, if, he fell at the th if he fell at the third last, everyone would have said he would have won. Mm. Now he didn't fall, but he, he did walk through it. And it took quite a bit out of him. He's only beat three lengths. Uh, he had to start pushing when, and he missed that bit of, uh, if he had jumped that really well and landed running. But that's Cheltenham. That's what you have to do. You have to do that at every fence. That's what championship racing is all about. You have to be good at every fence and you have to be good. That's why some horses are better than others. How do you get on with Michael and Eddie? Brilliant. Mm. Brilliant. Uh, the, the, uh, I must say now that I find them uh, great. Mm. And just, uh, I suppose, uh, all their horses are in Ireland as well, which is... It's if they weren't involved in Irish racing, it'd be a strange enough landscape in terms of the quality. Everything would change, really. Yeah, look at over the years, people have come and gone, and look who's to know. Michael is he's a fabulous supporter at the moment, as is uh, JP as well. Mm. But like, if things can change, you know, and things could change. But but at the moment, uh, he's put a lot into it, and Eddie is a fabulous judge. He's, I, I don't think I've looked at In terms at of specimens or in terms of form? Of, of horses, of, of, of buying horses. Mm -hmm. um, Mags O'Toole and himself will uh, look at every horse, at every sale that they go to, every horse. And like Mags will have her say, but Eddie will be the one that'll, that'll uh, make the final decision. And I've, I've looked at horses with a lot of people over the years and, I've, and uh, I have been amazed at how fast and how quick he can be and how his, his eye is so, so quick at, at looking at horses. Like it's his life because he makes his, that's where he makes his own living out of his buying and selling horses. So he's, he's very quick. And when you see their horses walking around in the, in the, in the ring, Swagger and the beauty. Yeah, you just they're just different. Mm -hmm. They're different because they're bought, they're all bought like carbon copies basically. They're, they're big, strong, chasing type horses and, and uh, with a good swing to them and, and, and the scope. They all have plenty of scope. Who's the best looking horse you've trained? The best looking horse? Well, I don't know who the best looking horse is. He lies know. in the eyes of the old. Yeah, look at Archie was a lovely horse, and so was so was Cardinal Head was a gorgeous looking horse, and and Road to Respect is a lovely looking horse, 
But uh, the best looking horse I'd say we have in the yard at the moment is a horse called Val Du. He's a beauty now, an absolute gorgeous looking horse. So he is. Hopefully next season when he's jumping fences, he'll be a good, a real good horse too. We'll talk to Noel about his runners over the weekend. He's more flat runners actually than jumps runners this weekend, which shows the, the dual purpose nature of the operation. But we'll also go through a couple of races briefly uh, over the weekend, starting off with the Lincoln tomorrow at Doncaster. Have you ever had a runner in this? No, I haven't. Yeah, it wouldn't be. It's interesting. Adam McGuinness is a horse going over tomorrow. And um, that Salt and Stall, ex Michael Halford, uh, has been quite well backed. And Adam's had a great Christmas or a great winter, rather. Yeah, his horse has been flying. He's been, he's been, he's been. Uh, Adam's been flying on the all weather in Dundalk. It's, it's, it's. He's got a good handle on it now, and he seems to be have it, have it well so stout. He's, he's. Uh, we're bumping into him this evening now, actually, and with, with. Uh, he is a filly that won very well up there, uh, early on or. Two, me- two meetings ago, mm. and we beat her the last day, and she's in the same race as we were in with Cheese Diesel this evening. So I'd say she could she could be thereabouts. Yeah, um, I'm going to sip up South Seas and the Lincoln tomorrow. There's also, uh, I suppose, the track with which Noel is very much most remembered is Navin, his local track. Uh, I think people would have blindly backed his horses down the years there. We've the Cork Stakes at 250. A cracking race, no, really. Son of Rest running against uh, Smash Williams and Sergei Prokofiev. I don't know if you've had a look at it, but proper sprint race. And it is actually the Cork Stakes, uh, but takes place in Navin tomorrow. I don't know. I'll have to butt out on this one because I don't know anything about it at all now, to be honest, which I didn't realise I was going to get, get uh, called uh, to, to honestly is the best, that. Honesty is the best policy. Uh, uh, what's Navin like as a track in general? It's a very, very fair track. Uh, it's If a horse gets beat in Navin, it's usually because he's not good enough, not because he can't get out. Or like, I mean, you could run, you can run, uh, as they do, run 30 horses around Navin. It's probably it's t- probably too many to run around anywhere, but they can. And because the straight is so long and so stiff at the finish, you'll never see a horse, or very, very rarely say, see a horse that should have won because he couldn't get out. Yeah. Um, unlike, you know, where the, the, you see the, the likes of the Ladbroke Hurdle or those big hurdle races in Leopardstown where you can see a horse getting caught on the inside and he can't get out. You rarely see that happen in Navin because of the length of the straight and the stiffness of the track. And it's, it's a place I love bringing, and I know most of the jumping trainers, I would say they love bringing a young horse because it's easy for them to learn around it as well. You know, it's a, it's a great big galloping track cool. and, and it's, it's a lovely place to go. I think the 5.45 tomorrow, that'll really suit Cube and Hope, exactly what Noel said there about the, the, the nature of the track and all that. Um, just in relation to the charity bet, David Jennings, he went for a caravan in the in the Irish Lincoln last weekend and, of course, won at around about 8 or 9 to 1, um, adding an impressive 1,100 to our toast uh, Irish Injured Jockeys Fund. And now the, the pot stands at €3,114 and we have another €100 tote bet this weekend to try and grow it even further. And I've gone for Muta Dafek in the 330 Limerick trained by Gavin Cromwell who of course um, won the champion hurdle at Cheltenham just very briefly before we go if she's easy run tonight looks to really be progressing for the mile and a half Dundalk yeah she's quite amazing I ran her <laughs> ran her in a, a claim of her 10 grand three runs ago and uh over a mile and a quarter and the reason she ran over a mile and a quarter was because the claimer was a mile and a quarter because she hadn't run any further than a mile at that stage and looked like as if she wasn't really getting a mile so Colin Keane rode her, gave him the most fantastic ride and just dropped her on the line and won. Another and mead man. Another mead yeah. man. A, a lovely, lovely guy. He's, I, I'm mad about him. But uh, he ended up, uh, she didn't get claimed, which was the, it makes me shake every time I think of it because her owner at the time was on holidays on a, on a cruise ship and he rang me and he said, how did, how, is she, how will she run? He didn't know. I said, Jimmy, she's just after winning. Uh, and I said, hopefully she won't be claimed. He said, no, if she's claimed, he said, my life is over because my wife is never going to talk to me again. She wasn't claimed. She went and she won the next day. Uh, Colin was away and he couldn't ride her and Declan McDonough rode her over a mile and a quarter again. And both of them thought maybe, or over a mile and a half, uh, was it a second? No, the, the mile and a quarter. Mm. And, and then uh, both of them said, you know, I think she'd get further. So we tried her a mile and a half. Colin came back and rode her again in a £26,000 race and dropped her on the line again and won again. So she's run three in a row now. Every and, chance uh, tonight? And every chance tonight. She's absolutely bombing. Uh, she's gone up, obviously, she's gone up a few pounds all the time. So she's heavier tonight and, and tonight is... Uh, 
not to 90, so she's going up all the time, but she's in great form and, and every chance. Thanks a million for coming in, Noel. Great to hear some uh, stories of some old horses there as well in particular. Just visit the tote.com. You can bet on Australian horse racing pools every day. Um, look out for Limerick Racing as well on Sunday. Uh, very good racing there as well. That's our lot for today, and we'll be back for more Friday Night Racing next week. Friday Night Racing. On Off The Ball. And they're off. Brought to you by Go Racing. Plan your day at the races at goracing.ie.